Good evening. My name is Mark Hintz, and I am one of the volunteer elders here at Hope Community Church. And let me give you a little background on who I am and, uh, and why I'm speaking tonight. Um, my wife, Meg, and I have been here since um, May of 2000, excuse me, 2003. I've been an elder since May of 2007. Uh, and during the week, I work at a local nonprofit as a professional fundraiser. Meg and I are part of what I would call, or Jim Archer has called, an exclusive club here at Hope Community Church called the 10-Year Club, which means that when my wife Meg was in kindergarten, I was getting my driver's license. When we first met in Rochester, Minnesota in September of 2003, I was really impressed by her maturity. <laughs> then a friend dropped the bomb on me, letting me know that she had just graduated from high school. <laughs> just three months earlier. So I did the only honorable thing that anybody in my position could do. I just waited a few more months until she turned 19, and then there weren't 10 years between us, and everything was fine after that. During the week, Meg manages the important business of our home and the education of her children. She is far better at her vocation than I will ever be at mine. My bride is my soulmate, my closest friend, a true inspiration, and exemplifies why it is not good for this man to be alone. <laughs> we were blessed with our first child, Emma, in February of 2007. If you've ever come to a morning church service, you'll notice that she is the girl on every Sunday wearing a princess dress. <laughs> and what's funny about that is, um, I mean, some people think it's a special thing, but no, this is really an everyday thing. And we've gone to preschool before, like the week before Halloween, and parents will be frantic and say, is it dress up day? And I say, no, this is just every day. <clears throat> I would describe Emma as like a fragile flower or fine china, and I barely need to raise my voice to ever get her attention. Now, Hazen is our second child, and he couldn't be anything like that. He um, was born in September 2008, and he's super high energy with extremely selective hearing, <laughs> and he really lives his life out loud. Um, sometimes we play a game where Emma and Hazen jump off the couch, and I catch them. And it has happened many times where I'm putting Emma down, and I turn around, and he is already in the air, <laughs> fully committed. He knows his dad's going to catch him, and some, sometimes I don't. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> but that never seems to bother him, because he gets most upset if he misses his turn on the next time around. So that is my son, Hazen. And then on December... 28th of 2010, our third child, Jairus, was stillborn. His life and death have profoundly affected our family, our marriage, and our hope in God. His story and the work of God is what we're talking about tonight. But let me back up for a little bit and uh, remind us how we got here with our cinematic Christmas. So on December 11th, Cor kicked us off, and he showed us that there is a connection between Will Ferrell, the elf, and John Reese davies the dwarf from Lord of the Rings, I am a little concerned that we're not up to speed on our little people nomenclature after that. <laughs> but he had some wonderful application for us, asking, have we, have you responded to the already message of Christmas? And are you willing to get out of the way this Christmas so that Jesus might increase? Then the next week, uh, he focused, he started with a Christmas story, and that, that one present that you really wanted, of course we know what Ralphie wanted, was that Red Ryder BB gun, but unlike Ralphie, who wanted to earn his treasured gift, Mary treasured God most, and Cor asked us to apply, like Mary, have you responded to faith, responded with faith to God's promises? Have you come to see and know personally how great the Son of God is? Are there any ways right now that the Holy Spirit is leading you to trust in Him? 
Then on Christmas morning, Steve Treichler uh, introduced us to a Charlie Brown Christmas and asked us, will you look past the trappings of the season and allow yourself to see Jesus as the perfect gift? And today we're going to talk about It's a Wonderful Life, that classic movie. What do we do? How do we respond? Or what can be thought of God when what we hoped for cannot be fulfilled or worse is tragically ripped away from us? Next week we'll wrap it all up with, in core we'll wrap it all up with Home Alone, this uh, classic that shows us, or, or perhaps core will give us biblical guidance on how we can repel would-be criminals with flying paint cans and tacks on your stairs. But back to It's a Wonderful Life. George Bailey, who's played by Jimmy Stewart, has spent his entire life giving himself to the people of Bedford Falls, New York. He has always longed to travel, but never had the opportunity due to various trials and circumstances. All that prevents him from doing so is George's modest building and loan company, which was founded by his generous father. But on Christmas Eve, his Uncle Billy loses the business's $8,000, which you can imagine at that time was quite a bit of money, while he was intending to deposit it in the bank. The Scrooge-like Mr. Potter, the evil guy in the, in the town, finds the misplaced money and hides it from Uncle Billy. When the bank examiner discovers the sh shortage later that night, George realizes that he will be held responsible, sent to jail, and the company will collapse finally allowing Mr. Potter to take over the town. Thinking of his wife, their young children, and others he loves, he concludes that they would be better off with him dead, and he contemplates suicide. But the prayers of his loved ones result in a gentle angel named Clarence coming to earth to help George. With regard to the movie's theme, the director Frank Capra described it as the individual's belief in himself and that he made the film to combat a modern trend toward atheism. Now you could really make the argument that if you really believe in yourself, you could function as an atheist. But, um, but I believe that if you watch the movie, you can see how Frank Capra wanted you to understand that there is a community and friends and a God that is still active in creation who cares about the outcome of your life. So spoiler alert, we're going to talk about the movie, and if you haven't seen it, sorry, because uh, we're going to ruin some of it for you. But it's really great, and you should see it many times. So in this particular scene, George uh, and his wife are just coming from their wedding on their way to their honeymoon. And a bank run is underway. And I don't know if you've heard what a bank run is, but back before something called FDIC, where the federal government insured your deposits, the bank could lose all its money, and then you would have no money. And things would happen called bank runs where there was a whisper or a rumor or perhaps factual that the bank was running out of money, and you better get to the bank and get your money or you're done. And so some people had money in the bank, and they, some had it in the building and loan, and so they were rushing the doors trying to get some of their money so they could pay bills and feed their family and all that kind of stuff. Well, they keep the doors open for the day, and George finds ways to give people what they, just what they need to get by for a week and so on, and they end the day with $2. Once again, though, plans are ruined, and George and Mary miss the train for their honeymoon. But in a bit of foreshadowing, we see George's wife Mary and his friends, Bert and Ernie, which, by the way, George, Hen uh, George Henson always claimed that that was just a coincidence. <laughs> they temporarily temporarily fix up this abandoned house for their honeymoon suite. We see in this early example in the film that George is not alone, and there are people who are concerned for the outcome of his life. Drawing parallels to the movie It's a Wonderful Life is, is a way of illustrating what my wife and I and our family have been through in the last 12 months might be puzzling to some of you. But in preparing for the sermon, I was really just surprised to discover rediscover God's work in the last year and how, in spite of tragedy, we were reminded over and again that God is for us, God is active and does not forsake us, God is concerned over the outcome of our life. <clears throat> so let me take you back to a year ago at this time. 
excuse me for a second. The afternoon of Monday, December 27, 2010, we came home from celebrating Christmas with family in Wisconsin and went out to dinner before we arrived home. We laughed and talked about how it was possibly our last time eating out as a family of four. I said out loud, in my mind, I can foresee our family of five, and I'm excited, which is a big thing for me to say because I'm always the one who's been scared about adding another kid to the family. What does that mean? How does that work? So all that was left to do after that dinner was to set up the crib, install the car seat, and wait for baby three. Uh, there was nothing else to expect because just five days earlier, he had a, um, a, her a perfect health score with an ultrasound. So we headed home and we put the kids to bed. But both Meg and I had trouble sleeping that night. And Meg especially couldn't get her brain to turn off and had a stomach ache, as well as random contractions she'd had for a couple of weeks. We managed to drift off to sleep eventually. But at midnight, Meg shot up in bed and had the distinct feeling something is wrong. Now she told herself, I'm just uncomfortable. I'm 35 weeks pregnant, so of course I'm not sleeping well and have some aches and pains. But after being up for a while, Meg went back to, back to bed and fell asleep. At 3.30 a.m. that morning, Meg woke me saying, my water broke. First thing I thought was, something is wrong. It's too early. I turned on the light, and the bed was covered in blood. Panic started to rise in both of us. We managed to throw together a hospital bag and prepare to go to the hospital. But it's December 28th, and of the five families, and that's just how prepared my wife is, five families we had, to, we had lined up to watch the kids at a moment's notice. All of them were out of town. In addition, I went to a neighbor's house, but I couldn't even wake her, even though I was pounding on the door frantically. I came back inside, and Meg had gotten a hold of a family here from Hope called the Irelands. And although they were in Portland, they called another Hopester, Laura Steinhorst. She immediately got in her car and came to our home. She soon arrived, and we left for the hospital. But our kids, Emma and Hazen, were still asleep, and they had no idea. Meg's contractions were coming very close together in the car and with more intensity and duration. By the time we reached the hospital, Meg's abdomen was in constant contraction, and that's not normal. We were ushered into a delivery room by a nurse already in scrubs and ready to take us in for an emergency C-section if needed. <coughs> she checked for a heartbeat and couldn't find one. She said it may be that Meg's abdomen is the reason for this because it was still contracting constantly and felt like a rock to the touch. An ultrasound doctor was called in. His wand passed over our baby, and Meg noticed immediately what she thought was the heart. But the doctor moved past and over to the placenta as if stalling for time. A large white mass on the monitor showed that, the, that Meg's placenta had separated. Our baby's life support system had attached, detached. They call this a placental abruption, and this one was catastrophic. The doctor passed the ultrasound wand back over to our child. He held the image in one place and said somberly, there's the heart. It's not beating. I'm so sorry. Our whole world collapsed with those words. All of our dreams and hopes for our baby and our family were gone in an instant. In their place was only the pain of our hearts breaking, of our souls screaming, of her searing tears pouring out. How could it be real? We had entered a nightmare and we could not wake up. I called Pastor Steve and he came quickly. We gave him the update that we were preparing for delivery. I remember sharing that I want and believe God can deliver our baby alive. But if that's not what will come, it is enough for me to know that Christ gave his all on the cross for that child. Pastor Steve prayed with us and reminded us that God doesn't waste pain. 
Labor progressed quickly, and it was time to push. But Meg said she couldn't do it. How do you deliver your baby when you know you've already lost them? She knew delivery was really the beginning of the end of having to say goodbye. But I encouraged Meg to push by saying, we want to say hello. Through immense tears, screams, and anguish, my beautiful bride delivered our baby at 7.34 a.m. Tuesday, December 28th, 2010. The delivery room was silent. There was nothing you could say. When I saw our child for the first time, lifeless and silent, God revealed himself to me and, was, and my mind was flooded with the image of Christ descending from the cross and these lyrics from a song that Waterdeep had done called 18 Bullet Holes. Oh God, it hurts so bad to love anybody down here. Oh, that's right. You know so well. One thorny crown, three nails, and a spear. They lay my child on Meg's chest, and I told her through tears, it's a boy. The nurse asked if the little guy had a name yet, and Meg said without hesitation, <coughs> His name is Jairus. He weighed in at 4 pounds, 1.2 ounces, and he was 18 inches tall. He was beautiful. He was perfectly made and could have lived outside the womb. We've never heard his cry, and we've never seen his eyes. All of our hopes and expectations and dreams for him died with him. We took pictures, sang hymns, read scripture, read aloud, and wept bitterly in our short time with him in the hospital. <clears throat> As I held him in my hands, God revealed a, himself a second time to me. As I said to myself, I now know how much I hate sin. Look at the collateral damage. <clears throat> From Genesis 2, 15 through 17, we have some understanding there. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And we know that Adam and Eve did eat, and death was brought into God's creation through this original sin. <clears throat> and again in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. <clears throat> it was just the three of us, our only day with our son, and then it was time to let him go. <clears throat> Three days later, on December 31st, 2010, we had a beautiful service right here at Hope. His little 19-inch coffin sat right there on the communion table. We used the opportunity to share where we found the name Jairus and how this story gives us hope in our mourning. Months earlier, by God's work, I was reading in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, 21 through 43, where Jesus meets a synagogue ruler named Jairus. His daughter is sick, and he goes to Jesus for healing. Jesus heals another woman along the way, and Jairus' daughter dies. But in the home, Jesus tells Jairus not to fear, but to believe, and raises his daughter back to life. By the way, there was no agreement on this name, and so when she said his name is Jairus, that was a Wonderful gift to me. 
We dedicated Jairus like all other babies at Hope, but with special words written by Pastor Steve. <clears throat> at the internment cer ceremony at the cemetery, God revealed himself to me again for a third time. While they were filling in the hole for his grave, I turned to Pastor Steve and I said, this is so messed up. And I thank Steve because he really does give, give you freedom there. God didn't make his people so they could eventually be put into the ground. Genesis 1.31 And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. There is no mention of death previously, nor in God's last act of creating the world. In fact, he sees everything as good. But then when we go to Genesis 3, we see what happens. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And I sensed that God was angry with me, that we still need to live in this world with death, a world that he had not wanted for his children. <clears throat> we had now entered a season that truly tested our faith. I found C.S. Lewis' thoughts from A Grief Observed most accurate. You never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. It is easy to say you believe a rope to be strong and sound as long as you are merely using it to cord a box. But suppose you had to hang by that rope over a precipice. Wouldn't you then first discover how much you really trusted it? There's no middle ground anymore if I am really trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of my sins and for the fulfillment of all his promises to me, even eternal life. Either my son is now no more, his lifeless body just lying in the ground, or he's actually ahead of me in the presence of God. I'm either setting my sights on things above and trusting in God to endure, or the alternative, I guess, is just to forget it on my own or with self-medication, to move on, to stuff it down, because it's too hard to really wrestle with any notion that Jairus is com completely and entirely gone. And like George Bailey in this part of our story, there is a period of anger, bitterness, and what are called words for the wind. Here's a selection from my journal during this period. <clears throat> what good could come from this? And yet I know that this question is one of those unanswerable questions. Questions like, how much of the color yellow is in a mile? Or what is the square root of a chair? Unanswerable because my finite mind cannot see the infinite workings of God. But if this is so, then why was the temple veil torn in two? Why give finite humans unveiled access to the infinite God if we are unable to comprehend him? especially when tragic grief cries out for comprehension, I would rather ask unanswerable questions behind the veil. In hindsight, little did I know, nor could I see or hear through tears and yelling all that God was doing. And so back to the movie. In this final scene of It's a Wonderful Life, the town, friends, and family all come to George's rescue with more than enough to cover the $8,000. Even the bank examiner is reluctantly moved to pitch in a few dollars. Clarence the Angel leaves a note for George stating the theme of the film. Remember, no man is a failure who has friends. And he gives thanks for helping him earn his angel wings, but, you know, that's a theological question. We just got to address it another time.
Just as George Bailey witnesses an outpouring of love and friendship from Bedford Falls, we, our family, have received these last 12 months an outpouring of love and friendship from Hope Community Church. You've become our Bedford Falls. And it starts off with a year ago at this time, the first Sunday in January, Pastor Steve preached on the gospel in grief. And he gave us seven things to think about. And they have guided our family, and I believe they've guided many people in this church in this past year. For one, he says that grief produces words for the wind. And this comes from Job 6.26. In this particular part of Job, he's been lamenting for a while. And his friends start to get a little impatient with him. And so Job says, Do you think that you can reprove words when the speech of a despairing man is wind? That gave us permission to ourselves grieve out loud, but it also asked our friends and our family and our church to allow us to grieve out loud. Number two, there is no way you can fix it. And this was really important for me because all I want to do is fix things. Number three, we were not created for this world. And this is why we grieve. Number four, Jesus Christ is in complete control. Number five, Jesus is weeping with us. Number six, Jesus gave his life for our grief. And number seven, grieving is a cry to what should be. No more death or mourning or crying or pain. And we see this in Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And we've seen in these last 12 months love and kindness beyond what we could ever have expected, especially from this church. At our memorial service, food was provided to feed over 150 people, and we didn't pay a dime. Funds were donated to cover all funeral and burial costs, including his tombstone. And just this last week, the last of those dollars were given for a well for living water. <clears throat> Meal deliveries. I don't know if you realize this. I don't cook, and that's a really good thing for our family. That's the way I bless them. <clears throat> So Meg was able to give up cooking for over four months because so much food was provided on a regular and predictable basis. Our home was cleaned every two weeks for six months. And this was important because our home was just in chaos. And we had those opportunities during those Saturday morning cleanings to leave, somebody watch the kids, and we would go have a time to have a date, grieve, be alone. And it was beautiful. We have, we have received countless gifts, hugs, and prayers. We never felt abandoned or alone in our grief. And in fact, this week, more cards arrived with his one-year anniversary. Our son was cherished here as much as we are, and the outpouring of love unto us was a great testament of you, Hope Community Church, as the physical body of Christ in this world. And then I received a great gift from my friend Cord Shimoleski. And he wrote a tribute to Jairus that I would like to share with you. <clears throat> There's a well used phrase in our household. It's a phrase that Jill and I have used to describe countless situations. Its words have correctly identified our feelings through all of life's curveballs. Though we cannot recall where it came from or how it got started, it is now commonplace in our vernacular. The phrase is, it's a harder life, but a better life. 
It's a harder life, but a better life. Getting married has been harder for us with casting aside selfishness daily for the sake of the other. But it has been a better life. We cannot imagine a life without one another. Going through college, paying off college debt, and then completing a Master's of Divinity degree has been a harder road to travel and yet has proven well worth it. The decision to pursue vocational pastoral ministry has reaped untold blessing but has been met with as many challenges both internally and externally. And God's gifting us with Drew and Isaac has caused us to champion that phrase over and again, harder life but better life. As I was getting ready for Jairus' memorial service, the phrase came to my mind. Only this time, it strangely rang hollow. For me, the words did not accurately describe how I was feeling at all. Rather, those words tasted bitterly. Those words provided no comfort and no peace. How could this loss be for the better? How could not having Jairus be better than having Jairus? For fear of falling outside of biblical fault lines, I want to be clear of my belief in the sovereignty of God. It is his scriptures that state, Shall we receive good from God and not disaster? The Lord gives, the Lord takes, blessed be the name of the Lord. It is his declaration that everything is accounted for, even something as little as the death of a sparrow and the number of hairs on our heads. So my questioning recognizes the exclusive role of God as Lord of all. In this world, pain will come, but we entrust ourselves to, to he has, who has overcome it all. I guess my question strike more at a world without sin and death, where separation of parent and child is not even a possibility. Surely such a life would be better by far. It is in this vein that I state having Jairus would be better. Having him would fill Mark and Meg with joy unspeakable. Experiencing Jairus' as brother, would hearten Emma and Hazen like no other because Jairus is like no other. His absence can be understood with trust in God Almighty, but must be simultaneously considered with a hatred for the collateral damage of this fallen world, as aptly spoken by you, Mark. With this in mind, I can no longer use the phrase, it's a harder life, but a better life. There's a new phrase that more accurately qualifies my feelings of Jairus. It's a cross-filled life. These words pinpoint how I feel about him. I believe his loss results in a harder life for you, much harder than any challenges you might have faced in raising him, and I trust you would agree. And yet, not having him does not create for you a better life. In so many ways, your loss due to the presence of death in this world has brought a huge amount of suckiness. I have sat with you, Mark, and heard first your hand heard first of your pain. How can this be better? How can not having Jairus be better than having Jairus? There's no comfort and no peace. While recognizing the sovereignty of God and the realities of this world, we can point to this and say, Sucks. So I cannot look at this and say, it's a harder life, but a better life. I must in fact say, it's a cross filled life. What if in this life the most we have to hope for is picking up our cross daily and following him? What if in this life the most we have to hope for is a putting off of self that screams for a tearless, pain-free life? What if in this life the most we have to hope for is entrusting ourselves to a heavenly Father and his plan no matter how mind-boggling it may appear to us? What if in this life the most we have to hope for is an ever-present ache of suffering and only the anticipation of a future glory? What if our better life, or even our best life here, looks more like Good Friday than Resurrection Sunday, more like death than it looks like life? Our life is a cross-filled life. As Paul once wrote, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. This will now be the phrase of our home. It's a cross-filled life. And because of Jairus, I will never forget this. And Cor thought he wasn't preaching tonight.
In the last 12 months, we've come to realize and hold on to some very important truths. From Proverbs 16:9, we're told, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And somehow, we have choices, and we make them. And God has plans, and he holds it all together. And it is a mystery. While we were planning one thing, having our third child, God was doing 10 million more good things that we couldn't see or know. And for example, I want to read the testimony of Meg's sister, Shelby, who's come to love Jesus as a result of all this. I thank the babies born in 2010 for beginning to push me towards a relationship with Jesus. When Olivia, her daughter, was born, I remember thinking, wow, there must be something more to this than just me. And, that, and as I went through the normal struggles of adjusting to a newborn, the constant demands of motherhood, of not working outside the home anymore, the strain it puts on a marriage, I found myself beginning to pray a lot. As I battled with my new self-identity, I realized just how weak I actually am. When I would look at Olivia, I would thank God for her. And when she would be difficult, I would pray for peace for her and strength for myself. And then Jairus died. December 28, 2010 changed our entire family. For me, it reminded me just how precious life really is. That even with modern medicine, things still don't always turn out how they should. Getting to Minnesota and being with your family, watching how completely you were allowing yourselves to feel the pain and how you were putting everything you had into Christ and allowing him to start the healing process on his own terms, not yours, showed me that that is how things are supposed to be. At the funeral, Pastor Steve talked about how death is not natural and we're not supposed to suffer like that. I had never heard that before, or if I had, I had never thought of it that way. From the time I got Mark's terrible phone call, and for weeks later, I clung to Olivia with all my might. I couldn't bring myself to really look at babies any younger than her. I never held him, and at the funeral, I could barely go near him. Seeing the pain in my big sister and her family broke my heart too much, and still does when I think about it. My heart broke over and over again for your loss, but I knew it wasn't about me. I've tried to get to know Meg better to help her through the loss of her sweet baby, and in doing so, I'm learning more about my own capacity for love and benefited greatly from watching her and the rest of your family's healing process. Even though I never knew Jairus, I thank him and your family every day for showing me that there is always comfort in Jesus. We just need to put aside what we think is the next step and trust that God already has it all worked out. And we have gained great comfort in the selection from 1 Thessalonians. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you, we who are still alive, who are left at the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God and the and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds and to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And that picture there is a tattoo that Meg has on her left arm with his footprints and the phrase, and so we will be with the Lord forever. To borrow a line from Pastor Steve, spoiler alert, we read the end of the book, 
And we know God's going to win. And in Peter, 1 Peter 1, 6-7, we hear this. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I always read this a certain way up until this last year. I always thought it said that those who suffer trials will be the ones giving praise, glory, and honor to Jesus when their suffering is over at his return. But through this past year and with the help of Tim Keller of Redeemer Presbyterian, I now see it that this phrase, that, that this praise, honor, and glory will certainly belong to Christ when he returns and to Christians whose genuinely tested faith will result in praise, honor, and glory from God. I mean, the first thought that comes to mind when I think that is, what in the world would God praise me for? But according to this, God wants to praise us when our faith is tested and it endures. You know, all illustrations break down, but I couldn't help but think of this one. It's like when a parent trains a child to ride a bike. At some point, the parent running along the bike without the training wheels needs to let go and to test the child's ability to keep riding. And when it does work, the parent praises the child for passing the test and the child reciprocates in their joy for having succeeded. So some application for you to consider. Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God now shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know how valuable you are? I mean, it's a rare thing that someone would die for a righteous person, but no one wants to die for a sinner. But what, about, what if you have a child? Would you let your own child die to save another person, an unrighteous, unholy, sinful person? Go back to this slide from earlier. God the Father knows sorrow because he's witnessed the death of his son. But it was not a tragedy. It was done for you. Christ died for the ungodly, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Consider my witness. I have held the lifeless body of my own son. And I could never do it. Not for anyone. Not ever. But you are so valuable to God that he let his own innocent son stand in your place. I hope this helps you understand how valuable you are. No man is a failure who has friends. We heard this earlier. Do you understand that the God of all creation, to use a term by another pastor, the voice of the hurricane is your friend? But what if you don't have any friends? Are you still a failure? What if you've gone through tragedy, suffering, or grief, and no one came to your aid? In addition, the good deeds and love expressed by this church to our family have been truly wonderful, but you know these things could be done by any group for any, any persons. We could have been members of the VFW or the biggest Trekkie Star Trek fans. Or because I'm such a huge fan, you know, the reigning Super Bowl champion Green Bay Packers could have made a pledge to crush the Minnesota Vikings for the rest of my life. 
And in the first service, when Steve was sitting right there, it was so great because I just <laughs> see that look on his face. But honestly, what difference does it make? What matters most is that God, the creator of all things, is your friend. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this. Someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Do you know how valuable you are? Do you know that the God who holds all of this together calls you his friend? Let's pray.